Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey, hey, it is Shay here, and welcome back to another episode of Casual Cattle Conversations. Today, we are continuing with our regenerative ranching series, and we are visiting with Caitlin Word yet again for another refreshing conversation. But this time, Caitlin's going to talk about the six, the six soil health principles and how those can really be applied in different operations. We really talk about how there are so many different operations within the cattle industry. And so we're going to talk about how each of those operations can still be applying these principles, some of the challenges they may face that are maybe different from different segments, um, but how to overcome those and just kind of talk about some different ideas for you. So whether you are a seed stock producer, you're a traditional cow-calf guy, maybe you have some hunting leases or really like the wildlife aspect, or maybe you're a stalker or yearling person. Caitlin offers some great tips and advice for everyone there. Um, so with that, before we dive in, I really want you to be setting an intention and thinking about what's a challenge for you on your operation? What's hard for you on your operation? This is a question that Caitlin poses towards the end of the interview, but I really want you to think about it before she starts talking, because something she talks about is if something is hard for you or challenging for you, especially if it's something that's just, we do it because that's how we've always done it. Think about how maybe you could change it or why that is and if it's really necessary. So think about your operation as a whole system and maybe some of those challenging components and then listen to Caitlin and see if maybe you are inspired to try some new ideas and make your life a little easier. But with that, let's dive into the conversation today. Attention ranchers, transform your land, livestock, and livelihood with Noble Research's regenerative management courses. Learn from their expert advisors and unlock proven strategies to enhance soil health, improve forage quality, reduce operation costs, and increase profitability. Through hands-on workshops, you'll gain skills to build a resilient and thriving ranch for generations to come. Space is limited. Visit noble.org today to explore their regenerative management courses and enroll. Invest today in your land, livestock, and livelihood. That link is also in the show notes. All right, Caitlin. Well, welcome back. And uh, like I think we joked earlier, uh, I think you'll deserve a co-host hat by the end of this. So I'm excited to have you back. Um, For those of you who are just listening for the first time, if you didn't catch Caitlin on the episode a few weeks ago, um, I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that episode. She has quite the extensive background in cattle production and is very passionate about grazing and really kind of marrying the animal sciences to the range sciences portion. So she talks a little bit more about her background in that in the first episode, as well as our Facebook live. So I'd encourage you to go back there um, and listen to that for a little bit more about Caitlin. But today we're going to be talking a little bit about which grazing option might be best for different operations who are really focused on applying those regenerative principles. And Caitlin, a couple of weeks ago on that podcast, that first one in April, it came out April 1st, you really brought up that principles are different than practices. Even though sometimes we like to interchange the words, they are not the same thing. So can you touch a little bit about what those core regenerative principles are? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for having me back. Um, excited for another fun conversation. Uh, but yeah, so we go by, we call them the soil health principles, right? Because everything we're doing from a grazing perspective is to, is to benefit the soil because um, without the health of the soil and without supporting that, then you're not going to have effective grazing, which means you're not going to have good feed and it, you know, you're not going to have um, a successful operation. So um, even though they're soil health principles, um, they're also just good general management and grazing principles, but um, we go by six of them at Noble. And so one of those um, is is uh, to consider your context, right? So everyone has their own context. So I think that's what you're wanting to talk about today a little bit is how do you apply all these within your context, right? So we're probably talking about that number one principle. Um, Another one is keeping the ground covered. So you wanna keep the ground covered um, in order to protect that resource that you have for lots of different reasons. 
Um, you want to minimize disturbance and a natural disturbance is, is what you want to minimize. So we're talking, um, we're talking, you know, any kind of chemical disturbance, mechanical disturbance. So spraying or mowing or tilling, those types of things. Uh, you want to be sure and increase and optimize your diversity. So you want to optimize and increase diversity from a uh, plant species perspective. You want diversity from a wildlife perspective, um, from a livestock and enterprise perspective. So the more, um, the more the better, right? So we, <clears throat> the, 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 the more options that you have and the more species that you have involved, um, the more impacts that you're going to have from all different facets, which is exactly what we want. Um, and you want to maintain continuous living roots. So continue continue to have living roots in the ground. So um, that's when you you start thinking about really what that's pertaining to is if you think about um, kind of traditional row crop systems and having fallow ground and bare open ground at certain times of year. That's exactly what you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. So we want to keep living roots in the ground year round. Um, cover cropping systems are really how we've tackled a lot of that in recent years. And then you want to integrate livestock. So um, someone told me, a, a producer that, that I've worked closely with and think highly of, uh, his name is Michael Vance with Southern Red Cattle. Some of the listeners may be familiar with him. He told me once that the land was made for the cattle and the cattle were made for the land. And uh, I think that puts it really simply and really well. And so without integrating livestock, we can't, you know, the, the land really can't thrive. They were made for each other and there's a, there's a synchrony that has to happen. So those are the six principles that we really try to follow and and benchmark by. Well, thank you for outlining those. And those are all definitely, you know, covered throughout this whole series, whether it's the conversation about we're going to have today where we're really going to be talking about considering your context. But I know this series is talking about um, grazing multiple species of livestock and cover crops, um, as well as a few other topics too. So we're really hitting all of them there. So as you kind of brought up with consider your context, I mean, and that's something that is, I think is so cool about agriculture and especially the ranching space and farming space is that we can all have such unique, we have the freedom to have such unique operations and unique goals and really build these businesses around the lifestyle that we want. So with that, we can have a variety of people who consider themselves cattle producers, whether they are focused on seed stock, whether they run wildlife or hunting leases, maybe they do stalkers and yearlings, maybe they're more your traditional commercial cow-calf, calf in the spring producer, and there's a lot of people in between there too. So I'd really like to talk about what applying some of these principles looks like for those different types of operations. So with that, let's start with kind of the seed stock and genetics producer. Yeah, so you're right that I mean, it's going to look different for everybody. And that what what I always like to bring it back to is outcomes. So what outcomes are you looking for? Um, because you have to strike a balance. I think that there's this com common misperception that um, you have to sacrifice livestock and animal performance for the land if you're going to be regenerative. So right, like if you're going to be regenerative and you're going to focus on the grass, cattle are going to suffer. There's this kind of misconception of that. And I understand where that came from, and it, it just came from, from mispractice and misinformation, um, but it's it's simply not true. And, and the seed stock producer and someone really focused on genetics and especially on like developing heifers or developing bulls, they're really concerned about that because nutrition in the early years of an animal's life and at the developmental stage and developmental years, I mean, it, it's, a, it's everything. <laughs> and so um, I did my master's work on reproductive development of heifers. And so you know, I, I, for one, absolutely understand that. And so the way that you're going to apply it differently there is there's what you have to understand is that there are times of year where you can sacrifice the land a little bit, right? So where you can, you can prioritize your cattle over the land um, and the land will have time to come back. And that's going to have to do with your growing season. It's going to have to do with your rainfall pattern. It's going to have to do with the type of forage you have, right? So it's going to be different for everybody, but there are times of year where you can you can you know be a little hard on your grass and um, on your ecology and it's going to have time to recover and then there's times of years where or times of year where you can be hard on your cattle and they're going to have time to come back but on the flip side there's times when you can't sacrifice one or the other and they're going to have time to recover before they go into dormancy and before they go into you know um, kind of a plateau of nutrition period and things like that 
So understanding those and how they play out is really important no matter what your context is. From, you know, some from a, a seed stock perspective, someone who's developing animals, you know, you really want to make sure and hit those high planes of nutrition that you need at certain times, especially with like developing heifers. Um, you know, there's this concern that you don't want to push too much nutrition and too high of a nutrition plane towards, you know, heifers at a certain, you know, early in their development, um, which with with grazing native grasses um, and, and you know, if, you, if you have some cover crops and things like that, it can play into it a little bit differently. The grazing native grasses, you're going to have a hard time overdoing it on them, but you want you want those animals to get to get the goodie out of the grass. And so um, something that some producers do, especially, you know, I keep referring back to developing heifers, you can do this with developing bulls too, but those animals that you're trying to maybe prime for a sale, you're trying to put some, some cover on them, you're, um, you know, really trying to push their development over your cow-calf herd. Um, you can do a leader follower grazing system where you have those heifers or those bulls or those younger animals with a higher need for nutrition grazing in front. And so you can graze them through a pasture pretty quickly and just just take the top third um, off of the grass there and move them along. So they're getting that really high quality grass. And then you can have your animals with a lower requirement following in behind um, under a density where they have less selectivity. And, you know, they're still getting, you know, what they need, but they're not getting that super high plane of nutrition that your younger animals need. And so that makes, that's a way that you can help meet those different needs for different classes of animals. So different ages and um, different needs um, without, without having to do it out of a feed bag. So another question I have on the seed stock side, and this was brought up to me a few years ago when I was doing an interview about um, how to make the fencing infrastructure easier. The guests on there talked about how some of their seed stock clients um, are hesitant to move more frequently because it's challenging with the amount of breeding groups they may have. Is that something you run into or do you have any tips or ideas of how some producers are managing that today in your realm? Yeah, it's just tough. Um, if you are, if you do have a lot of breeding groups, it's just going to be hard to manage. Um, the, the, the best thing you can do is consolidate your herds as much as possible. Um, if you have you know, let's say you have, you know, multiple, let's say you have kind of, you know, I guess different, different lines of genetics. Um, and you want to keep those separate because you like to look at them differently. You like to show them to, to producers differently. And, you know, you don't want to sort. Um, but if they have the same nutrition requirement, if you, you know, if, it, if they're a cow calf herd or if they are your heifers or if they are your young bulls, um, consolidating those from a grazing perspective is going to be your best bet. And then, you know, whenever you need to separate them later, you can also, there's some people that do consolidate at certain times of the year. So consolidating during the growing season when you're trying to take advantage of your grass and you're really focusing on taking advantage of that as much as possible is a great idea. And then you can have them separate during different times, you know, the rest of the year. So um, consolidating, you know, during calving season and then maybe during um, weaning season and um, or even later into your breeding season, you know, you can have them together at certain times of year and you can even just do a gate cut you know, a lot of, a lot, a lot of sea stock producers or animals are pretty docile. They're used to being handled. And, um, it's pretty easy whenever you're moving cattle from one pasture to another to just, you know, do a gate cut. Um, and you can split animals that way. Um, and I know that, you know, it's inconvenient for some people and they don't want to do it, but as far as, as man managing multiple herds, it also depends on, um, your resource availability. So if you have, um, if you have sufficient land to be able to do that. But the, the fact of the matter is the more herds you have, the less rest you're going to be able to give your paddocks and you're going to be able to give your grass. Um, and, you know, when you're not able to rest them adequately, you don't have as good of recovery. Um, and, you know, those principles are going to suffer from a diversity and a ground cover and maintaining living roots, you know, those types of things are going to suffer. And so consolidating, especially during the growing season is, is your best bet, if, if at all possible. Well, I think the other standpoint, depending on the resources and help available was to look at AI to cut back on some of those breeding groups too. I mean, that. Oh yeah. Sense. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, thanks for talking about kind of that seed stock producer standpoint. Um, what about, you know, people who are maybe are a little more focused on wildlife, whether they have 
hunting leases or other goals, but you know, maybe that's that's just something they're a little more focused on than other cattle producers. Yeah. Um, again, it's gonna come down to kind of kind of your outcome. So um, for example, my husband works for the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife and, and he manages a wildlife management area um in our cross timbers, you know, eco region. And they're really focused on quail habitat. And um, they do graze cattle. They have a grazing lease every year, but they're really focused on, on on quail habitat. And so what that means is that, you know, there's a lot of um, plant species that, that they they value that a, a cattle producer would not because um, it makes good feed, feed, feed for quail um, and then also nesting areas. And so, you know, from a, a livestock perspective, I drive out across there and I'm just go, man, this is awful. Like the nutritional quality is terrible out here, but they have ma they've managed specifically for that. And they defer areas to allow certain plants to go to seed at certain times of year because they want that plant to proliferate, where if you were a cattle producer, you'd probably want to go in there and maul that and knock it out and allow sunlight to come down to some of your grasses that are being overshadowed by some of these other species. And so understanding what what you're after um again that's within your context and so um it's okay to manage for for certain for certain things there's there's this saying manage for what you want and not for what you don't and so um from a wildlife perspective what's important to you is it important for you to have feed sources for um for quail or certain birds depending on on what your um wildlife species is that you're really bringing a revenue in from um and it's it's the same with deer of course and so a lot of a lot of properties that is their main source of income, um, and cattle are a secondary source of income. And so, something that I would keep in mind though is that, you know, cattle and 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 deer specifically, um, but wildlife they have different they have different feed sources, and what we're after is diversity. And so, I never want to manage for just the grass and just for livestock nutrition, and you never want to manage just for deer. Um, because the other things are going to suffer. And that's what's important with the diversity. So even if you don't have multiple enterprises, let's say you just have a stalker operation, or let's say you just have cow-calf, be aware that the livestock are a part of that ecology as well. And in order for it all to function well, you need to be able to provide for them. And, you know, this all works as a system together. So if you just cut the considerations for wildlife out, even if it's not an enterprise for you, if you cut those considerations out, you're going to suffer in the long run because that's a piece of that system that you just, that you just pulled out. Um, and, and a pillar is going to crumble somewhere. And so if that is a, an enterprise for you and something you want to consider, um, I think that that just makes you all the more in tune with what's going on in your pasture because it matters to you on a level that it might not to someone else. You have some skin in the game there, but everyone should be considering from the wildlife perspective because, um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, bringing the birds back and the dung beetles and, and those kinds of signs of life. But I mean, really, if, if you don't have, even if you're not making money off of them, even if you're not into agritourism, or even if you don't have a hunting lease on your property that you're bringing revenue in from, just having those species proliferate on your property, you're going to see the benefit of that on the livestock side from a nutrition perspective, because again, you're just feeding that ecosystem. I appreciate you saying that. I mean, it all comes down to, as I talk about a lot on the show, or my guests talk about a lot on the show, that systems approach and knowing yeah. what's all a part of the system. And even if you are going to put more emphasis, maybe on one area, you still need to keep things balanced out because everything is connected. And there's a, there's a really cool, and this is just a visual for some of your listeners. There's a really cool, um, I guess, you know, activity that, um, one of my coworkers here, Jim Johnson has done before where he's taken Jenga blocks um, and he has a tower built up and he goes, this is, this is the ecosystem. Um, and we came in hundreds of years ago and, you know, we thought we were going to improve things. And so, you know, whenever we do certain management practices, you really are pulling a piece of that block out. You go, okay, well, I don't like this weed. So I'm going to spray it out. Well, that weed had a purpose in that system. So you pull that block out. Um, and we go, well, you know, I really, you know, maybe, maybe you're not managing your grazing, you know, adequately and you're, you start grazing out some of your high succession native species. Well, you know, those feed the soil in a certain way too. So then you're pulling that out. 
um, when you put fertilizer down, you're inhibiting some of the things that are happening on a microbial level of the soil and those things stop functioning as well and you pull another block out. And eventually that system gets so weak and there's so many holes in it that it will come tumbling down. And so whenever you are applying a management practice, just be aware of, I'm not saying not do it, but I'm saying be aware of the implications and maybe some of those unintended consequences because that system in a lot of areas um, on the continent has crumbled. Um, and it's because we add things in that we think are helping, but what is that taking away in the long run? I really like that visual and I might have to add that idea to my speaker toolbox as well. I've done it with like a string of yarn where I have people stand in a circle and yeah. they all represent different aspects. And when one pulls, you know, how does it pull on the rest of the system? Butterfly effect, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's a good one. I appreciate that. So I do have one question about the wildlife um, portion of it. Do producers who, you know, maybe have hunting leases or that is a large portion of their income, I know we just talked about, you know, it being a balance, but are they doing maybe more continuous grazing plans or less frequent moves? Is that um, accurate? I don't know that it is. Um, and I'm not saying it's not, but I'm not sure that it is. So I don't know if I can speak to that. Um, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't put it, them in a box and say that they tend to be more on the continuous side or, or tend to not. Um, if anything, I would say that people with a real conservation mindset have really um, been early adopters of kind of this regenerative mindset, you know, as this is, we talked, you know, in our last podcast about how this has kind of become a you know, media craze, right? Um, because they see the value in the, the ecosystem health and in the ecology. Um, I would say that may maybe some of them, because they don't see or maybe they don't value the livestock side of it if they are not if if that's not an enterprise for them so if someone is focused on wildlife a lot of the times they do see the value in integrating livestock but they will um they'll lease their property out and have someone come in and graze that and you know they're not going to put the infrastructure in probably mm -hmm. um to do you know like an amp grazing um system and so i think maybe you'll see some of that there um the, the people that really have skin in the game and the livestock side uh, probably are a lot more in tune with some of the adaptive management practices from a grazing perspective. But um, I wouldn't say that I would see a trend one way or the other. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious because I think that was something that came up in one of my college courses when we had to create grazing plans for these figurative ranches or whatnot. So that's just yeah. is what you see. The Red Angus breed continues to grow in numbers and influence. Why? It's because of the quality cattle and the hardworking folks who produce them. Red Angus females are known as the beef industry's most favored female and have dominated the market for more than a decade. According to Superior Livestock data, Red Angus heifers command a $92 premium per head compared to all other breeds. The longevity, efficiency, and calm disposition of Red Angus females make them the ideal cow for today's producer. To explore opportunities through the Red Angus breed, visit redangus.org. Let's see, we've talked about seed stock and genetics. We've talked about people who have hunting leases. What about kind of those folks who are stalker and yearling operations? What do some of their um, grazing practices look like and how are they maybe different from those cow-calf guys? Yeah, so stalker operators are really motivated by high planar nutrition, right? Um, a lot of them are getting paid on the game. And so, you know, the, the higher plan of nutrition you can push towards those young cattle, those young growing cattle, the, the, the bigger your paycheck is on the end. And so you see a lot of stalker operators um, really taking advantage of the, the cover cropping systems and the interseeding um, and trying to add boosts and more yield into, into their, um, into their operations. But um, that's a really, stalkers are a really great opportunity to utilize density. And so high stock density is something that can be really intimidating because it's something that the people who are adopters of it, they see the value in it. And they're just like, oh my gosh, you have to do this. And it's super intimidating to people because they're just like, I don't want to put half a million pounds on the acre. Like, um, I mean, cause there is some labor, there's some training involved in that and it can be really intimidating and, and it's also time intensive, right? You can't leave half a million pounds on an acre for, for two days, mm -hmm. um, even much less of a week. And so there's some, some time involved in moving your cattle and people can be intimidated by that. But I think the stalker operators are really motivated 
um, and they see the value in that. And so, and it's, it's also, I wouldn't say it's easier. I mean, stockfish can be flighty, right? So there's some training that's involved in that, but, um, you really do see a, a lot of, you know, the stalker grower kind of guys gravitating towards these high density. And I think it's because you can, you can take advantage of your growing season that way. Um, and during the growing season with your cow calf, what do you have going on? You're calving a lot of the times you're calving and you've got young calves. And if you put, if you put those animals under density, I mean, we've done it, but you've got calves squirting out everywhere. <laughs> and it's just something that you have to learn to manage around. I mean, we move cattle every day during calving season and that can absolutely be done. Um, and it's just a matter of learning. But from the stalker side, I just think that there's a lot of opportunity there. And you think about Birdwell Clark Ranch. So a lot of people are familiar with them and what they do. They move stalkers, thousands of stalkers, like six times a day. Um, because that within their context, context they, had a, they had a need, you know, to be able to make profit off of these stalkers. And they looked at the resources they had and they, they said, this is the best use, to, use of them. And they found a way to make it work. Um, and it's incredible. And now, you know, they, they've taught a lot of people um that that there's ways to make things like that work even in areas you know they're not doing it on cover on you know cover crops and irrigated land or anything like that they're doing it on rocky native pasture um but they can take the best advantage of their growing season and they can um utilize density in order to proliferate you know their forage yield and things like that and so i think there's a lot of opportunity in the stalker sector um, in order to utilize, you know, utilize these principles, especially from a density perspective, um, and see some really cool results. Because also, if you have stalkers, you only have them from a short period of time, right? So you can afford to, for lack of a better word, you can afford to really hammer a place. You can afford to go in there and do do some, you know, there's a there's a type of grazing called total grazing. Um, Jaime Elizondo kind of, you know, is behind all of that. But uh, total grazing is just, I mean, taking everything. It's not take half, leave half, it's taking everything. And you can afford to do that if you have a long rest period following. If you can, if you can rest and allow that place to recover for a long extended period of time. And when you have stalkers, you really have that opportunity a lot, a lot of the times. Um, so there's some cool opportunities in there for sure. So you brought up a point about the cow-calf side, which I think just leads us right into that bucket, because that was kind of the last bucket we were going to discuss today. You said when you're calving, you're moving cattle every day. Yeah. Are you using the sand hills method where you're moving the cows that have not calved and then leaving the pairs behind? Or are you kicking pairs out to different pastures? How is that being managed? And I think a lot of it will have to do with, you know, what, pa you know, what your pastures look like, how big they are, um, and kind of what your, your terrain looks like that. It can be a challenge. It absolutely can. We've got some rough terrain down here, um, down on the Red River where we've done that. And we take everything. Now, if you've got a cow that just calved that morning and she's got a little bitty baby, <laughs> um, you know, you can leave her and pick her up the next day. Because a lot of times we're just moving one pasture down. It gets challenging whenever you're using utilizing lanes and you're, you're moving, you know, way down the lane. That can be challenging. Um, it's just, I think something that we've just kind of accepted during calving season is you're just not going to have everybody all together all the time. Um, you have to be really aware of, I mean, you have, you have to be a good stockman in order to do it because you need to be able to read your, your animals and tell if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're pushing a cow to leave her calf behind, you know, you need to really be aware of that because we've done that before and left calves behind and especially with heifers, you know, you, you've got to be really careful. Um, but I mean, it absolutely can be done. We haven't really gotten into the wrecks. We've never, you know, left a calf behind to, to his detriment for a long period of time or anything like that. But we move everything all at once. Uh, if you do have a, you know, a really like if you had a calf that was born, you know, a few hours before you just leave him, leave mama, come back that afternoon. You can leave the gate open, especially if you're moving down a lane and you're moving cattle into a pasture, you know, over, you can leave a gate open and let them kind of wander over um, the nice thing about calves, we use whenever, you know, we're grazing under a single strand, whenever a uh, single strand of hot wire, whenever we're moving cattle like that. Um, and the nice thing and the, the curse of having calves is they can just duck under. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the times, if you get a calf left behind, he'll follow up eventually. Um, but I would say being a good stockman is a big part of that and being patient. You're not going to be able to move those cattle, you know, whenever they're calving as quickly and as cohesively as you are, you know, a set of stalkers or a set of dry cows. Um, but you just, you just have to be patient. Um, it, it's definitely, it's, it's a, 
it's a lesson in in you know having good observation skills, especially from a livestock perspective. Well, and I think it goes back to what time of year are you calving to? Because like as we're recording this right now, my husband and I are just like mm, not quite a third of the way through calving. Yeah. For us in North Dakota in early April, there's not like grass is just starting to think about getting green and growing. Right. So it's a completely different scenario. But um, yeah. And my parents, they fall calve, well, late summer, like mid-August through September. So it's just completely different how you can kind of manage calving in general, depending on your location and when you're doing yeah. it. And a lot of people like to calve and, you know, in this part of the world, they like to, you know, they have calving pastures, which are big, open, a lot of the times Bermuda grass, which hasn't even really come on. <laughs> and um, you like to do that because it's easy to find calves, especially if you're tagging calves, right? But it's completely counterintuitive to you know, the way animals, whenever, you know, whenever she's, she's going to calve, what's she going to go do? She's going to go find a thicket somewhere. She's going to go find some shrubs and she's going to find a place to stash that calf. And so um, being aware of your train, because some of this train down here is, is pretty rough and thick and brushy. And, you know, you can have calves stashed all over the place. Um, and again, I think just being aware of that, it, I, I think a lot of the challenges to moving cattle as often as you do in a regenerative system, you know, um, you know, they call it adaptive multi-paddock systems or managed intensive grazing. You know, there's lots of different names for it and everyone has their definitions. But I think one, a, a lot of the challenges, if you're just aware of what they are, you can you can work around them and work with them and adapt to them um, as long as you know what they are. But people tend to get really intimidated by them and go, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, oh, I don't want to move calves during calving. I'm going to have calves left behind and squirting out. And it's just like, well, in practice it's, it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a lot of things you can do to mitigate it. As long as you're aware of those things, it's kind of like, um, you know, knowing there's a lot of power in knowledge. And so, um, as long as you're aware and you know, then, you know, you can work around those things pretty, pretty easily. Absolutely. Is there anything else on the, you know, that traditional cow calf producer side that you want to touch on outside of what we just talked about with, um, the calving side? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, I would say that's the most not dynamic, right. But you just have so many different things going on at different times of the year, whenever you have cow calf, because people are worried about, okay, well, what about breeding season? What about when I'm weaning? What about when I'm calving? You know, those kinds of things. Um, just find what works for you and don't worry about what works for somebody else. Um, there's people that we get really concerned. That was something that we kind of dealt with too. It's like, oh my God, the bulls, you know, the bulls are a pain in the butt outside of the 45 days that you need them <laughs> and mm -hmm. you've got to find something to do with them the rest of the time. Right. Um, there's some people that, so you had your breeding season. This is just, just something that I was talking about with someone the other day. So from a cow calf perspective, you have your breeding season, utilize your bulls, pull your bulls off, pull them off for, you know, 45 days, two months, whatever it is. And then they throw their bulls back in with their cows because they, they, you know, whatever cows aren't bred, if she is dry, you're probably going to, to want to, you know, you're probably going to sell her anyways. Um, but if you throw those bulls in there, if she gets bred, you know, she's going to be out of your calving season, but she's going to be in somebody else's calving season, or she's just going to have that added value anyways. And now you're not having to manage your cow herd and your bull herd and worry about keeping them several pastures away so that those bulls aren't smelling that cow coming to cycle and wanting to jump fences. And so, you know, there's things that have been done traditionally, um, and I don't say that in a bad sense. It's just the way that we've always done things that we don't really question because it just makes sense because it's how we've always done things. Question them, like question those things and say like, why, you know, if, if something's a pain in the butt for you, <laughs> do it differently, you know, or think about doing it differently. Be like, why is this a pain? What can I do to alleviate it? And honestly, what is the worst that could happen? You get a dry cow bread, you know, is that really a bad thing? How can you market her? You know, so just be aware that, again, those challenges, if you're aware of them, you can always kind of find a way to work with them most of the time, nine times out of 10. Yeah. Or some people do that and they pull their dry cows and then put the bulls back in and then however they're going to yeah, work if, with if, dry yeah, cows. If you, if break they don't you can pull dry them. cows, you know, throw the bulls back in or you can throw the bulls in with your dry cows and you can have them all bred to the same breeding season. I mean, you have a lot of options and it just depends on, you know, your marketing. So it depends on, you know, what the market's doing, what you have the availability to do. Um, and if you have, that's another thing from, from a grazing perspective, if, if you're managing your grazing and you're, you know, keeping an eye on your stocking rate and, you know, you're, um, 
if you're if you're measuring all those things and if you're aware of them and if you're managing them right you have a lot of opportunity to you know hey i could potentially hold these cows over and get them bred um, and sell them as bread because I have the grass to do it. Um, there's a lot of people that run out of grass and that causes them to miss a lot of opportunity for profiting off of, of off of animals, any kind of enterprise, uh, because we know the markets are really volatile, right? And we tend to be market takers, not market makers. Um, and having grass gives you a lot of opportunity to be a market maker um, because you have the ability to hold animals over without having to call call the mill and get, get a load of feed in to take care of them. Um, or whenever things go south for a lot of people, you know, whatever you do have, you can hold on to because you have a reserve of grass. And so, again, that's why, you know, the, the guys with skin in the game on the livestock side tend to be pretty motivated. Um, and the stalker guys tend to be just I mean, not always, but they tend to be a lot more in tune with what's happening because those markets change, you know, from day to day and are so volatile. Um, because if you have that bandwidth and you have that margin to work with, you know, it can really literally pay out for you in the long run. Well, I really appreciate you walking through those different buckets and kind of some of the challenges and different opportunities people can look for, whether they are seed stock, your traditional cow calf stock or yearling or, um, do wildlife leases or hunting leases, I should say, are there, so my question is my next question, I guess how can cattle producers, you know, what tips do you have for taking, going out and taking a good, honest look at your land and your resources and determining maybe which principle have I been ignoring or which one do I maybe need to put a little more focus on so that you get that full stack of Jenga blocks, as you talked about earlier, um, or just yeah. structurally you're more solid. Yeah. Um, I mean, my number one advice is just boots on the ground. Take a walk take a hike. I mean, get out of the truck and just, and just go for a walk, honestly, and look around and look down, look straight down. Just go walk in the middle of pasture and look straight down. What do you see? Do you see, do you see bare ground? Um, do you see some thatch? Do you see some litter on the ground? Like bend down, like, you know, dig through it. Is it degrading into the soil or is it kind of oxidizing and just laying there? Um, take a look at your plants. Do you have pedestaling plants? Do you have diversity? Do you have high succession plants or do you just have a bunch of so-called weeds um, that your animals aren't eating. Um, why aren't they eating them? Is it a selectivity density problem or are they just, you know, you know, low, super low quality and there's something, you know, really low succession that you want to work out of? So just benchmark yourself by making some observations. Um, but a good way to kind of look at where you're at from a grazing perspective as well is to look at I guess the alternatives. So how much are you having to feed every from a cow calf perspective or a seed stock perspective? How much are you having to feed um, in hay or in supplements and for how many days every year? Um, if, if, you know, you, and, and then start thinking, you know, how can I reduce that? How can I optimize this? Right. Um, because a lot of people, if you're feeding four months of hay every year, you know, you, you have a stockpile problem. Why do you have a stockpile problem? Um, is it because you're not resting pastures long enough? Um, is it because you're overstocked? Um, is it because of your forage resource? Is it, you know, what, you know, everyone's going to have different answers to these questions, but I think asking yourself these questions kind of puts you, um, puts you in a position to address them, to address those challenges. But I mean, having, you know, those observational skills to just go out and look and see, because the nice thing about these principles is that they're very tangible. You know, it's not something that's um, that you have to have an ex expert come explain to you, you know, is do I have diversity? And, you know, you know what diversity looks like. You don't have to name every plant. You don't have to know the names of your grasses or you don't have to know, you know, you know what, you know, if, if this is native or, you know, this is, you know, a forb or, you know, is this a woody that they'll eat or will they not? You don't have to know that. Just be able to look out and see, do I have diversity? Um, and then from a cover perspective, you know, do I have forage density and do I have ground cover that I'm, you know, able, able to lay down? Um, and if not, if it's standing and oxidizing or laying down and oxidizing, you know, you have a, you, you have a herd impact problem. Um, and so there's some of those resources, you know, you know, we have those resources on our website, different articles and things like that to help you address that. Or we have 
you know, additional resources through, um, through like some mentorship that, you know, to help address some of those things, but just being, look, look for green things growing all year round. You have green things growing all year round. If not, how can you address that? Um, there's, there's a million things to look at. So I know I'm kind of rambling and probably not giving a direct answer, but I think just going again, having boots on the ground, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of cattle producers, unfortunately, and it's not a dig. We're, we're busy. I mean, it's, there's, there's a million things to do all the time. And it's really hard whenever you're just trying to get from one thing to the next to the next to go, I'm just going to stop my truck right here. And I'm just going to go for a 30 minute walk out into the pasture, but just doing that can tell you a lot. It can tell you a lot. A lot of us don't take the time to do it um, and to go and to walk around and look at what's going on around us and see, you know, and it just take a, take a, we call it a, um, a six foot view, like just stand and just look down <laughs> and, and see what's there. Um, take stock, take inventory of your pasture. Um, but doing that even just like once a week, um, can, can, can have a big impact on how you see things and you'll start, start to pick things up. Well, and it's healthy for you. It could be quality family time. You could Really? Good yeah. That have grounding. That's a big thing. It could be grounding. Yeah. Just take a <laughs> mental health break. Just go for a walk yeah. and, and think about, you know, I think also have an idea in your mind of what you would like to see. You know, what, you know, before you even go look, you know, what would I like to see today? I have, you know, I would really like to see two species of birds. I would really love to see, man, I'm going to see if I can see a dung beetle out here. Um, I would like to see at least three of this certain species of plant because I would, you know, I haven't seen them around. Maybe if I go for a walk and can find them, you know, and then you give yourself a little bit of encouragement on top of that, that, Hey, I'm, I'm good. I, I, there's progress, you know, there's, um, I'm, I'm doing something right. Or you may not see those things and they start asking the questions. How can I, how can I get there? Um, and, and find the ans answers for that as well. <clears throat> All right. Well, Caitlin, do you have any final thoughts before we wrap up today? I don't think so. I've enjoyed these conversations a lot. I appreciate you having me and giving me the opportunity. Awesome. Okay, folks, that's a wrap on that one. Thank you, Caitlin, for doing such an amazing job and having this conversation with us. For those of you who are out there listening today, if you want more information about how to improve what you're already doing, make some changes, or just learn more about the topic we discussed today or what we've been discussing this whole series, Head to the description or the show notes, and there is a link there to Noble's website where they have tons of different information for you. Now, if you are hosting an event and you're looking for a speaker, I would love to come connect and engage with your audience, whether it is virtual or in person, a keynote, a workshop, or a panel discussion. I am booking events for the rest of 2024 and even into 2025. So I'd love to connect with you, head to my website and there's a contact me form and that's the best way to get a hold of me that goes straight to my email. So I see that pretty regularly and I'll get back to you ASAP. So with that, have a great day and happy ranching folks. <laughs>